A very good day to one and all. Welcome to another session on the various topics in pediatric surgery. Today we will be discussing about two very important abdominal wall defects seen in newborns. One is exomphalus and another is our gastrocytosis. So, before we go on to the topic in depth, let us have a brief view regarding the history behind the abdominal wall defects. So, uh, Ambrose Parry was the one who first coined the term exomphalus to denote a herniation of uh, abdominal organs, particularly small bowel, through a defect in the umbilicus and wh which was covered by a thin membrane. Airfield proposed a conservative line of management of uh, exomphalus. Grobe introduced the concept of using mercurochrome in the conservative management of exomphalus. Alshausen proposed the usage of silotherapy in the management of abdominal wall defects. Moore and Stokes proposed the criteria to diagnose gastroschisis and they said that for an abdominal wall defect to be called a gastroschisis, there should be herniation of bowel contents or bowel without the absence of any overlying membrane and this herniation should occur to one side of the umbilical stump commonly on the right. So, coming on to the epidemiology of gastroschisis and exomphalus. So, exomphalus has an incidence of 1 in 3000 to 4000 live births, whereas gastroschisis has an incidence of 3 to 4.5 per 10,000 live births. One of the predisposing factors to these abdominal wall defects is the presence of a young maternal age. That is, young mothers are very prone to have fetuses or children or infants or newborns who are likely to have exomphalus or gastroschisis. There is an increasing trend noted all over the world as far as gastroschisis is noted. The initially, it was proposed that exomphalus was the most common newborn abdominal wall defect, but nowadays gastroschisis is overtaking exomphalus as the most common abdominal wall defect in newborns. Other factors which seem to predispose to abdominal wall defects in newborn children include smoking, substance abuse, etc. Gastroschisis has 1 to 2 percent associated chromosomal anomalies, whereas chromosomal anomalies are significantly higher in exomphalus with, an in, with about 30 to 40 percentage of cases having chromosomal anomalies. So, let us now come to the embryology of these abdominal wall defects. So, the abdominal wall defects, the occurrence of the abdominal wall defects is closely related to the elongation and rotation of the mid cud. We find that by around the sixth week of gestation, there will be a physiological herniation of the mid gut as it elongates extra coelomically. And by 10th week, the rotation of the gut is complete and it tends to return back into the abdominal cavity. So, in exomphalus, what happens is that there is failure of return of these herniated bubble loops. So, this is said to be because of, fra uh, of failure of the lateral embryonic folds to fuse in the midline. So, bilateral embryonic fusion defects mm -hmm. include exomphalus and gastroschisis. Cranial embryonic fusion defects include what is called as pentology of cantrel. And caudal embryonal fusion defects include extrophy bladder and cloacal extrophy. So, this is just added information. So, like I said earlier, so here what happens is there is fusion of the lateral embryonic folds resulting in failure of return of the herniated bubble loops. The defect is usually around 2 to 5 centimeters centrally placed and the bubble, bubble is covered over by a sac and this sac has three layers to it. It has a peritoneal layer which is abutting the bubble, it has a Watton's jelly layer and an amnion which is the one which you see outside. So, usually a large defect, a large exomphalus called an exomphalus major is, com is associated with thoracic cavity maldevelopment. Basically, it results in lung hyperplastic changes. Now, gastroschisis, here the herniated bubble loops do not have a covering membrane or any layer covering the bubble loops as you can see here. And this usually occurs to the right of the umbilical stump. Now, why does it occur? It is possible, why do you have a gastroschisis occurring? It is possibly because of the rupture of the membrane containing these herniated bubble loops due to weakness involving the right side of the umbilical stump. Stevenson proposed another theory which stated that there is failure of the yolk sac and vitline structures 
to get incorporated into the umbilical stalk causing gastrocytosis to occur. So, how do you diagnose these abdominal wall defects antenatally or is it possible even to do it? It is very much possible. 90 percent age of cases these can be detected in the late first trimester or second trimester. So, this is particularly important because these can be detected very early in gestation. Maternal serum alpha fetoprotein levels can be raised in the presence of open um, in the raised in the presence of abdominal wall defects like exophilus or gastrocytosis. First trimester diagnosis of an exophilus which must raise the suspicion of presence of chromosomal anomalies. Differentiating an exophilus and an uh, gastrocytosis in the newborn in the in, uh, fetal period, especially in the first trimester, is very important because. If a gas exomphilus is noted in the child, then it warrants doing a fetal karyotyping to look for any chromosomal anomalies. An ultrasound of the fetal sconography or an MRI of the mother can give us an idea regarding the presence of a lung hyperplasia. A lung hyperplasia can be very easily detected by using what is called as the LT ratio. So, LT ratio is nothing but the lung thoracic transverse area ratio. So, which gives us an idea regarding how the lung is, whether it is hyperplastic or whether it is normal.